Good morning. So today I'll be talking about how to combine DNA evidence to get more match information. And as a disclaimer, I'll be talking, I'll say that we, the true allele system is what computed uh, the various uh, statistics in this uh, presentation. So we begin with a mixture sample. And sometimes you get more than one mixture sample. Here we're looking at two mixture samples. Uh, they could come from the same item as two amplifications. They could be two different items. But regardless, suppose they contain the same two contributors. Uh, but we're seeing very different patterns between sample one and sample two in this str CSF locus. Well, the computer uh, can look at all 15 str loci and mathematically separate uh, those out, determining the mixture weights. Mixture weight is both a mean and a standard deviation. There's uncertainty in science. And we get about a 10% mixture. This orange uh, component is the one we're going to be interested in as well as a major component. And in the second sample, it's about a 50-50 mixture. So the key scientific idea here is the joint likelihood function. This is described in our November JFS paper and in other papers. And the idea is how do you explain evidence uh, based on some hypothesis? So let's look at one hypothesis, that we have a pair of alleles from one contributor where the genotype is 1011. <coughs> And that's shown in blue. And in orange, we have another contributor whose genotype is 1212. Uh, if there's a 90% uh, blue to 10% orange in the first sample and a 50-50 of blue to orange of those allele pairs, those genotype values, in the second sample, then you can see that that accounts for the data. So that would be a good explanation. They would have a high likelihood. What the computer does is it tries out all possible explanations where the alleles are, where they aren't. It might try out a, uh, you know, a 13, 14. It doesn't care. We just have low likelihood. And after it tries out 10,000 or 100,000 uh, different possible explanations, it computes a genotype. When we begin, the number of possibilities at CF is maybe 100 allele pairs. And then looking at data constrains what the possible genotypes can be, and that uncertainty is expressed in probability. If we look at, so I'm showing three different genotypes here. Uh, in blue, that dark blue, that corresponds to sample one, and probability is put at the allele pair uh, 10, 12, as well as 12, 12, uh, which you can see is uh, feasible. Uh, from the data in the first sample. There might be a major contributor here and a little bit there, a little bit there. Maybe that's the major, and they're both there. Uh, sample two also distributes its probability between two different allele pairs. But when you look at the, all the data together, the only, there's really only one explanation that can account for all that data, that is, the STR data constrains what the possible answers can be, and the probability, looking at sample one and two, in the light um, blue-green bar, is jointly uh, one explanation, that it's the allele pair 12-12. So notice as we're starting here that these genotypes are inferred objectively. There's no concept of a suspect or against a database you'll be comparing against. It's all done just from the data, in this case from two samples. Uh, it turns out that uh, one of the contributors uh, is a 12-12, uh, and we'll see what the match strength is. You can, uh, the way uh, likelihood ratios and match statistics work, you'll get a much larger match statistic proportional to the genotype probability uh, in the likelihood ratio uh, from, a, from a lot of genotype probability, and you'll get less from a little bit less. You'll get almost nothing if you have, if your uh, method hasn't put genotype probability on that allele pair value. So here's the genotype match information. Here are the loci, 15 loci. Here's CSF. And here are the three bars again. They're very small, but there's the dark blue from one sample, um, nothing really from the second sample at CSF, and then a bar that goes all the way out to 10. This is on a logarithmic scale because information is expressed in the, in the exponents, the number of zeros, the powers of 10. Uh, that way, we can add information together. 
If you prefer, you can think of just multiplying them, to, uh, the likelihood ratios together. But in most papers on information and DNA match statistics, we use the number of zeros, uh, the powers of 10. So here you see about one power of 10 if you use all the information. And what you might notice is that the first two bars represent sample one and sample two for every locus. And the third bar in that greenish blue uh, is larger, having more match strength than any of those match, any of the match information from the separate samples. The total information from sample one is 10 to the ninth, uh, 10 to the tenth, around uh, a billion, uh, uh, which is nine zeros. Sample two by itself, that SDR data of 15 loci gives also about a billion, nine zeros. But when the computer has to explain both of the data items together in a joint way, uh, we end up with uh, really twice that information, a billion billion as the mass statistic. I think it's like a quintillion or something. So that's the basic principle that using more data in a, in a rigorous uh, mathematical way will provide more information than a match statistic. So I'd now like to turn to a case example. Uh, in March 7th, in 2009, in Antrim, Northern Ireland, there was an attack on the Mazarine barracks, uh, which the real uh, Irish Republican army re claimed responsibility. There were four unarmed soldiers collecting pizza from two pizza delivery men when a car drove up this road and in less than 60 seconds, two hooded gunmen came out and fired over 30 rounds from automatic weapons into the people there, repeatedly firing into soldiers on the ground. Uh, two pe so, uh, young soldiers died, uh, Patrick Azamkar and Mark Quincy. An investigation was launched uh, that involved over 50 uh, police investigators. And this is the getaway car that was burned out in order to hide the DNA evidence and destroy it. It was only partially burned, however. Uh, and so uh, uh, teams of forensic scientists recovered uh, DNA evidence. Uh, there was different amounts. There was a uh, latex glove. There was all sorts of things. But these were the three touch DNA items in which there was no DNA match statistic. And they involved a passenger side safety belt buckle, uh, a cell phone that was used to make a phone call that, was de that described the attack shortly after the attack, and a matchstick that was used to light the car uh, that was found on the side of the road. So this, the second two items uh, were directly connected with the crime, whereas the first one uh, was merely at the scene of the crime. The data were sent to DNA labs. This, these particular data uh, for the th these three uh, evidence items were sent to Cellmark in the United Kingdom and near Oxford. And they did multiple amplifications on each one. In fact, on uh, the cell phone, they did several enhancements as well. So we this is the first profile. And what you can see is that the data from the matchstick has ambiguity. That is, you're not going to get a unique profile out of this data. The first thing which you can't see is that the scale in RFU goes from 0 to 120. So most of these peaks are around 50 or below. And uh, using ordinary human interpretation methods, you're not going to get much of a result. But this is, these are sources of uncertainty. We have mixtures. Uh, here at D3, there are multiple peaks, as there are at D8. There is low. Uh, DNA quantity at tho one these peaks are well under 50 that are uh, being identified. Uh, there's no DNA visible at some loci like FGA, and there's probable allele dropout at other loci. So this is highly ambiguous, uncertain DNA evidence. To address that uncertainty, multiple amplifications were done. And so here are three different amplifications. Uh, and here are the full profiles of the 10 uh, SGM plus STR loci for amplifications A, B, and C. And there's a lot of data here, and, and the attempt is to use a consensus method, but in fact there's little consensus. At locus D21, uh, we see that in a comparison with a suspect uh, Brian Shivers, indicated by the red dots by the Somark lab, uh, there's 
zero, two, or one numbers of alleles that have appeared. So there's, there's no match statistic, and the risk you run without a match statistic is that the court doesn't have to admit that into evidence because there's no statement that talks about how rare this profile is, how specific it is to a defendant. So at this point, um, it's about a year ago, Cyber Genetics was uh, asked to look at the data. And this is a joint likelihood function. In this case, the computer is looking at uh, three different amplifications, A, B, and C, from the FO1 locus. And the computer tries out, again, all possible combinations of different allele pairs. So the blue bars move all over the place. The orange bars move all over the place. Different heights, different amounts. And this is one particular pattern that fits the data pretty well that explains what we're seeing. There are other peaks elsewhere. Uh, when it's all done at FO1, in fact, uh, most of the probability did land on this allele pair 6, 9.3 at FO1. Now, regarding how this was combined, this shows you the increase in information. Uh, looking at the, the data of the three samples, each of them in isolation, A alone, B alone, C alone, uh, we see match statistics of say, 25, 27, and 6 over those 10 STR tests. In gray above, I've shown the logarithm, the powers of 10. 25 is a number between 10 and 100, which is between uh, 1, 1, and 2 ones. And so that number, uh, 1.4, is describing uh, how much information is present. It's the exponent of the number 25. Looking at the pairs, we, uh, the computer could look at A and B together. It could look at a and C together, it could look at B and C together. Examining 20 tests simultaneously increased the information to about three or four zeros after the one. And finally, when the computer looked at all three evidence items together over all uh, 30 STR tests, it arrived at a number that had an information of six zeros after the one, a little bit over a million. These, experiment, these computer runs were done at least in duplicate on the lower end and a lot more on the higher end in order to show reproducibility in court. And the computer's match statistics uh, for the uh, match stick on the side of the road was about a million for this, uh, to, uh, Mr. Shivers. So this is after the genotypes have been computed, comparisons are made, and the number was about six billion for the cell phone to Mr. Shivers. And the number was about six trillion to another suspect, uh, Colin Duffy, to the passenger side. Since these two items were directly linked to the crime, Mr. Shivers uh, was convicted and sentenced to 25 years. Uh, Mr. Duffy was uh, believed by the judge to be in the car, but was not linked to the crime. On December of this year, uh, after it was a seven-week trial, and I testified uh, for a few days in November, uh, Judge Hart ruled that uh, the true system was admissible in evidence, concluding that he was satisfied the stage has now been reached in the case of this computer system where it can be regarded as being reliable and accepted. He was satisfied that Dr. Perlin had given evidence in a credible and reliable fashion. And in light of those conclusions, he saw no basis in which he could probably exclude the evidence, and therefore he admitted it. It's also worth noting that last week, the Pennsylvania Superior Court um, issued a presidential published uh, decision um, uh, which makes uh, this sort of true allele in particular, but computer interpretation of mixture evidence having precedent in the state of Pennsylvania. It was noted at the time, on the same day as the verdict, uh, when Mr. Uh, Shivers was convicted, that in, particularly in crimes that are terrorist attacks, where no uh, witnesses will come forward and the main evidence is forensic, that these DNA techniques that talks about Trulial and uh, the computer systems and how this is a new approach, uh, DNA techniques used in Mazarin conviction to pave the way for future trials, that this is a new tool for investigators, prosecutors, and uh, the way we're using it also for the defense to get more information out of the same DNA evidence. It's also worth noting there are many crimes in the U.S., 
particularly drug crimes and so on, where witnesses don't come forward. And the cases, like in Mazarin, are made purely on the basis of forensics. So as the uh, great seal of the U.S. says, e pluribus unum, out of uh, many, uh, there comes one. In this case, we saw uh, many police investigators, over 50, working with many forensic scientists in order to gather evidence. We saw the crime lab uh, working with its data with the best that people could do, together with computers. Out of many, we arrived at one answer. And also, looking at uh, multiple DNA amplifications and looking at a lot of data and combining it mathematically, we were able to get max scores in the range of a million that were persuasive, as opposed to looking at them even by computer in isolation, when there was no human score, that were far less. Uh, if you're interested, uh, the slides for this talk, last week's much longer uh, CLE, Mazarine talk, and other talks uh, will all be on our website. This one will be on by this afternoon. Thank you very much.